Good morning. Welcome to day two of the sixth annual Health Disparities Conference at Teachers College, Columbia University. This is an opportunity for me to ask any questions that anyone has uh, regarding their experiences so far. So of course, the first thing that uh, we'd like to do is to welcome those of you from HBSS 5800 who are actually following instructions and have shown up here this morning. So if you're from HBSS 5800, please raise your hand. Okay, so then you should come down to the front. You don't have the option of being in the back just because we are a class, even though yesterday I made a hit joke about how I don't like when people tell me to come and sit in the front. But because I am your Professor Wallace and you are in HBSS 5800, then we're going to have a bit more of an intimate experience this morning, okay? And of course, after we have this intimate conversation, then you can feel free to sit wherever it is that you would like to sit. Uh, let me begin by explaining that not only are we uh, an annual health disparities conference, the sixth annual health disparities conference, but we also provide an opportunity for students who can afford the $1,300. Uh, to receive one credit uh, for what we feel is an exceptional research course. So they are actually in receipt of a course syllabus. We actually have been um, dialoguing online for the prior week of the conference. Uh, they have been answering questions online regarding health disparities of particular interest to them. And they will also uh, post online on our online platform this coming Monday regarding those aspects of the conference that they found to be most exciting. And of course, I expect them to identify my opening address. No, that's a joke. <laughs> that's only if they want to brown those for extra credit and really try and get a, as high a grade as possible in the course. <laughs> no, uh, I fully expect them to, um, to perhaps talk about the keynote address by Dr. David R. Williams of Harvard University. So if there's anyone who did not uh, attend the conference yesterday, you must know that the keynote address of Dr. David Williams was appropriately declared perhaps the very best talk on health disparities ever given in the history of mankind, or at least since we've been talking about health disparities in 1985. Who would agree with that? Raise your hand. Okay, so I urge you, Everyone who is a, a part of this conference needs to go on the website and register. And in particular, look for the link to the webinar and go to Total App Casting website and register. You will get a code so you can access the archive of that talk. And it's something that you need to share with your undergraduate students, with your students in graduate school, with your colleagues. Uh, and frankly, I want, to send, I want to share it with my 86 and 87-year-old parents <laughs> because for those who are living long enough and uh, who have buried most of their friends by the ages of 86 and 87, they need to know why they are perhaps living longer and why they had friends who, who have passed away at younger ages. So to be true to the nature of this session, which is a conversation and opportunity to ask questions, um, let's begin by having um, this gentleman ask the first question. You will ask the second question. So please come to the microphone. Yes, you're in HBSS 5800. So because we're in person, you are now on the spot and under pressure. <laughs> Unless, of course, someone else in the audience wants to rescue you and they have a question to ask. Come on. So that, that'll be, you have uh, two minutes to figure out your question. Or you can make a comment or an observation. I'll take you off the spot. Dr. Wallace, my name's Sean. I'm taking the class. I'm in the clinical psychology department. Oh, Sean from clinical psychology. And do you know that I am a PhD clinical psychologist I too? I do, I do. Okay. okay. So I'm, what you need to do, Sean, is you also need to figure out what other course you can take with me because I write great letters of recommendation. So right. if you take yeah. two more courses with me, like this summer, addictions and dependencies, or HBSS 4818, we will be on our road right. to um, a lifelong affiliation. Yeah, that sounds great. So my question uh, is in reference to uh, Dr. Williams' uh, opening discussion yesterday. And yes. He was talking about the impact of uh, 
access to wealth and income as a, a way to look at the disparities outside of race. And I was wondering if he looked at or if you looked at uh, average debt of the household and how that varies between ethnicities and the impact if you stratify it by uh, household debt, if that the impact mm -hmm. that has. Well, you know, that, that's very interesting. And of course, I can't answer that question for him, but I can certainly comment and consider the reality for so many people who are enjoying privilege. Okay, so you, as Dr. Williams mentioned, first of all, you have a whole segment of our, you can sit down unless you have a follow-up question. You have a whole segment of our population, uh, as Dr. Williams said, you know, when someone dies, they inherit money. Whereas most African American and Hispanic families, when someone dies, they're trying to scrape up money to bury them. Uh, and you consider the, the many families where not only when the grandfather dies is there considerable wealth to be spread among family members, but many families, it's just assumed that literally everyone has a trust fund. I mean, imagine having a trust fund that begin that you can begin to have access to when you're 18, where you literally are receiving $7,000. $15,000 a month for life. Okay, that's the kind of wealth that, that um, you know, for those uh, other groups, for African Americans who are just a few generations out of uh, enslavement, if they haven't been fortunate enough to advance to high incomes, it's just not, uh, it's just not gonna happen. Now, when you talk about debt, I mean, it's one thing to be able to, you know, it's a privilege to be able to go in debt. I'm thinking about one of the young men who I mentor who was, uh, admitted to Morehouse University. And we were excited, oh yes, he's going to Morehouse, he's going to Morehouse. His family was considered so poor, they could not, they could not even get loans. Okay, so when you're talking about being able to even apply for a credit card, do you know how, I mean, how do you think the whole concept of, 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 of cards where there's a set amount of money on it? You know, you have a $200 a month limit, you have a 200 limit period. Okay, as opposed to those with wealth who are able to go in debt to the tune of $25,000 uh, credit card or even higher. I mean, I can't imagine having a credit card with an unlimited amount, but the reality is that there are people who have American Express cards, you put $100,000 on it, you pay it at the end of the month. So it's a privilege to even to be able to go into debt. But the concept that Dr. Williams talked about where um, you know, in good times in the 70s, an African American's dollar, one dollar, was worth 55 cents, and it now perhaps being worth just a nickel <laughs> for an African American or Hispanic family. So it's an interesting concept that you are suggesting the amount of debt, but I would just qualify it by saying it's, it's, it's a part of white privilege to even be able to go into debt. It's something that, that, um, that a lot of individuals can't even conceive. My brilliant young man who I was mentoring, uh, he, he and his family could not even enjoy the privilege of going into debt for him to go to Morehouse College. So I'm in at the end, and then the worst part about it was that his mother didn't even tell us until like the end of July that they had been, that there was no ability, way he was gonna go. For her, it was like, just kind of like, oh well, you can just take a year off. Why? Because he was gonna be the first one to ever go to college. So there was, I'm the one with the sense of urgency. We've got, you know, four weeks to get you in the, into a college, you know? And luckily he went to an historically black college, Cheney University, where the tuition was $2,500 a semester. And then he qualified for a Pennsylvania Keystone Scholarship because in our mentoring network, there was someone who was an adjunct at Cheney and said, oh, he can get a Keystone Scholarship. So we ended up getting one for four years and he could actually take the, the public transportation to college. So he's not a part of that legacy of Morehouse. Instead, he's a part of the legacy of Cheney University where he went on to get a master's degree uh, and is doing very well. Just got his first car. You know, but even that, you know, how do you, you know, to be able to go into debt to get a used car as an individual, still a challenge, you know? If he had the kind of generational wealth we talk about, he would have had a, a brand new car since he was 18 as a part of his trust fund. So, thank you. Okay, who's next? You, you'll be next, because he's hesitating. <laughs> Who else has a question? Let's go. I guess it's more of a comment. Uh, my name is Lori Beth Patsy, and I'm in the Thank crowd. you. Um, it's, it's really been um, enlightening since yesterday. Um, 
Dr. Williams especially, there were a lot of things that were really fascinating at, from the start to end with the statistics that he spoke of with regards to the global cost of health care and how we contribute to 50% of that and we're only, we're less than 6% of the population. That was amazing. I It really struck me when he talked about how zip code is more influential than genetic code when it comes to health determinants. Um, I work at a patient-centered medical home, so I'm really fascinated in when he started to talk about what can we do, and he mentioned um, some community health workers initiatives. And so I'm really looking forward to looking into that a little bit more, learning more about that to help um, bridge the gap. And um, Yeah, so you can also, when you do your literature review, you can also uh, not only look into community health workers, but also peer educators, because, you know, that community health worker might be more of a global term that we hear, but there's a lot of research on peer educators, so you can also begin to think of those concepts interchangeably, and Ms. Quinones can just see Ms. Dr. Mindy Fleelove on the front row here and give her her check, since that's what you're waiting for. <laughs> it was fascinating, you know, the discrimination scale that he um, showed the daily discrimination and how that correlates with, um, well, and effectively that that's perceived as a stressor, and so it affects your health um, and uh, the vigilance scale. So all of that was very, very Yes, and so that really goes to the heart of, of my current conceptual framework and also what um, I hope to contribute to the edited volume that will come out of this conference and what I really want all of you, particularly in the course, to, to grasp, and that's the manner in which we really need to use a stress and coping biopsychosocial environmental cultural framework. And so it was very gratifying for me to basically see how, yes, that's a framework that encompasses all that Dr. Williams talked about. Uh, and certainly, it's, it's really critical that we move away from what I'd like to call some of the earlier generations of health disparities research, which might actually be considered blame the victim and deficit-oriented research. So blame the victim research is when we have studied variables and we end up basically concluding through our research that some of the uh, explanatory factors operating in health disparities or in health status actually has to do with variables located in the individual. So uh, whether we're talking about um, you know, level of education, whether we're talking about uh, even their race, we're talking about having to go much deeper to also understand some of the underlying mechanisms that are operating. So that takes us to the social context. So when we, for example, um, hear Dr. Mindy Thompson Fully Love's keynote address this morning, we're going to understand that there are those individuals who for decades have been looking at place, who've been looking at the nature of the uh, environment uh, and the extent to which those factors uh, directly uh, are linked to health status. And so one might not uh, conceive of the social context, but stress in the social context ends up being critical. And so Dr. Williams went straight to the heart of the matter in terms of what it means to perceive racism, to uh, on a daily basis perceive even just slight insults uh, and inconveniences and ways in which you experience disrespect uh, on, a, on a regular basis, the way even before you leave the house, you begin to anticipate that, okay, I have to dress a certain way because I don't want to, I can't put on a hoodie, everyone else is gonna be comfortable in sweats today, but no, I'm anticipating that because of the color of my skin, I have to dress a certain way so it will not be assumed that I am uh, a thug or that I'm someone who can be stopped and racially profiled and harassed, yet it may still occur nonetheless that when I go to, order my deli sandwich, everyone else basically can, can say, okay, I'm going to have my sandwich prepared in the order in which we arrived at the deli counter, but instead, as someone with dark skin, you're funny that people are getting in front of you, or that the person behind the counter is actually overlooking, and, o overlooking you and, and asking the person behind you who came in, can I help you, sir, can I help you, ma'am? Or what would you like, what kind of sandwich do you want? And you're standing there saying, am I supposed to be assertive? You know, it's not even, uh, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning yet. <laughs> and I'm experiencing what may be just the first insult of the day. Or when I'm even in my car, I'm beginning to anticipate. Uh, and so the idea is that 
uh, it's very important that we also understand structural racism, institutionalized forms of racism. Uh, one of the things that, um, that I used to talk about when I was in 1994, the first African American woman to move through the ranks and get tenure in the 100 year history of Teachers College, and it was something to celebrate. Well, after five years, it was an embarrassment because I was still <laughs> the, the only one who was uh, present. Uh, and then it became a further embarrassment when it seemed like only light-skinned African-American women were gonna get hired here. Uh, so it's like, come on, you know, can we get someone with some you know, uh, skin color that is clearly declarative of the fact that they're a member of a minority group? Can we get somebody a little cocoa brown, a little reddish brown? How about some dark chocolate up here in the big house? Uh, so the idea is that there are these factors that are operating that, you know, how, you know, it's like what kind of interview process, what kind of process in terms of uh, academic and professional advancement occur so that if you, you know, pick up a magazine or you turn on the television or you look in academia, you know, okay, why is everybody so light-skinned? Uh, so, you know, these are very subtle processes and some of them are so invisible and so difficult to even codify, yet, um, they are operating nonetheless. So we have to take a social determinants approach. We have to look at stress and coping uh, within a social context, biologically. What happens, okay? What neurochemicals are released in terms of stress? Psychologically, socially, uh, in the social, environmental, cultural context. Uh, because institutions are cultures and they have norms and they have values and they need transformation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Who else has a question or comment? Yes, June, please. Uh, yeah, my comment is about the um, immigrants. I was yes. really surprised what Dr. Williams was saying about the deterioration of the immigrants' health. And I was a little um, disappointed that we didn't have time to talk more about that, like a little panel discussion after. So I don't know if you can just give some light on that. Well, the, there's nothing like a free download. And so if you Google the Institute of Medicine 2012 report, how far have we come in addressing health disparities? In the very, and, and that's what I asked all of you to do as a part of the online course, HBSS 5800. What stands out, and the best thing is that you can now you know, search PDFs. So if you want to know every word that William said in that PDF, just put you know, control F and, and search for his name. But there's going to be a great summary. You're going to see things that you can uh, quote. But the elaboration, I mean, there's so many of us who have read about the way in which immigrants experience you know, decline in health. And, you know, the, psycho the, the, the um, psychiatric, psychological data in terms of mental health status or depression increasing, uh, you know, by the third generation at a level that's just enough to depress you, <laughs> frankly. So this is what I also say to um, all of my graduate students. You know, you, you take a course or you hear a talk and the purpose is to stimulate your interest. You know, the best thing about doing research today is that you don't even have to go to the library. You know, you can just Google Google Scholar, and then from Google Scholar, put into the search engine, immigrant health, you're gonna see so many articles. Then you can even filter it. Maybe you just want the one since 2010. And you need to begin to read. I had a student the other night in one of my courses who described, uh, we were talking about some of those economic factors in our reading. This is a course called, um, uh, competence with multicultural populations, research and practice. And she had watched eight documentaries as a result of being stimulated, and most of them were 50 minutes long. And so that's how she independently pursued expanding her knowledge. And it's the easiest thing to do to even be typing a paper or working online and just to have a documentary running in the background that, sh that is the audio. You know, we have to turn off the music and turn off the TV and start in our offices having some kind of, have Dr. David Williams' talk running over and over and over and over again in the background. Uh, and so this kind of independent research. But 
yes, it, it, it's shocking, it's depressing, as Dr. Williams said, yeah, you may be a second or third generation immigrant and you have advanced in terms of your socioeconomic status. Now you have the stress of also using Western Union to send money to people back home who have no idea how you're suffering <laughs> to be able to earn that money. And what you have to deal with in terms of some of the perceived discrimination. Uh, so yeah, you know, everybody's sending money back to Haiti and back to Africa and back to the Virgin Islands and the family members are there in Guatemala and Honduras. They're waiting for the Western Union. Yes, and they have no idea what you've gone through to get it, nor how, even though you have that privilege of now being here in the United States to work, you know, in some cases make those toilets shine at the Hilton Hotel, <laughs> you know, and work overtime in food services. They have no idea that part of what you are seeing is that your children, do you, do you know how many immigrants, particularly those who advance socioeconomically are like, I need to send, you know, I'm a medical doctor here in the United States, but my children are turning out awful. I need to, can I just pack them up now and send them back to Ghana to boarding school? <laughs> you know, because they have, you know, are they experimenting with the marijuana that the other suburban kids, you know, we live in the suburbs. I mean, what's going on here? So just to see for a nationally representative sample that it's just not one father and one family saying, my kids, their health, their psychological, emotional, mental development, something's going on here. I, yeah, we have this big house, we have this privilege, but what's happening to my child? Can I just send them back to Puerto Rico to my grandmother where they, they will have no TV, no video games, no internet access, but at least they'll have character and health. <laughs> so again, to understand that there are these invisible factors operating that seem to contribute to these declines in health. And it would be great if we could just say, oh, it's just what you're eating, it's just the new diet here. And in some cases that matters. But when do you look at the psychological data, you say, well, I, that's just not red dye number five. <laughs> There's something else that's happening when they are suddenly experiencing, and, they may, and that's the worst part. At least African Americans, a lot of times, they know when they're perceiving discrimination. A lot of immigrants are like, oh, I'm here, and they don't even see the perceived discrimination because they haven't been socialized into the reality that, um, have you noticed the color of your skin? Before you open your mouth, and they can assume that you have a nice British accent, <laughs> and that you're, you know, treat you better than an African American, you've already perhaps experienced something. But there's also ways of adaptively coping with stress. And so that's why we focus on what are adaptive ways of coping, what are maladaptive ways of coping. So am I supposed to introduce Dr. Fully Love at, at um, five of? Okay, so let's begin. Oh, I have a minute and a half. So it's very distressing. And so that's why we need to have mandatory courses in cultural competence so that we be, can, can we begin to Put on the lens. It's not to blame and condemn, but it's like, okay, I'm in the United States now. What's going on here in this social context? It's not just me pulling myself up by my bootstraps and now I'm here and I'm better than the people back home who are waiting me to send them Western Union, <laughs> sitting under a tree having a papaya, <laughs> you know, raising grandchildren who are running around, enjoying the fresh air. No, I'm getting on this packed subway touching this dirty subway pole, somebody sneezing in my face, now I got the flu, now I gotta go to work sick. <laughs> okay, now, I'm, now I, I didn't get the schedule I wanted. Why do I keep getting, I, keep, I asked for my vacation, why did I get this schedule? You know, not understanding when, instruct, when institutional racism is occurring. Not understanding discrimination when it's occurring. So we really need to learn how to put on the lens and say, wait a second, there's something about this social context. Do I need to start looking at things a bit differently? Do I need to understand covert invisible violence? What is covert invisible violence? Is it when I am subject to stereotyping and misinformation and myth and discrimination? Oh, is, do I need to talk on the phone to others experiencing this? So we are absolutely honored that we have Dr. Mindy Fully Love, Dr. Mindy Thompson Fully Love of Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health, Social Medical Sciences, as well as uh, of the Columbia University College of Surgeons and Physicians. 
and she is going to amaze us with the work that she has been engaged in for a couple of decades now. And so put on your seatbelt and strap yourself in and get ready for the psychology of place. Morning, everybody. Morning. We are the hardy. <laughs> I wasn't feeling very hardy this morning at 6.30, were you? No. And clearly all those other people, they weren't either. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about work that I've been doing for decades, as Barbara said, looking at the psychology of place. When I started uh, studying place, that was a pretty like radical idea. People were like, oh, why would you wanna do that? Um, place, that is, what is that? It doesn't even matter. Um, especially in my field, psychiatry, where we think of the, the mind and the self as somehow just sort of contained within our bodies so that everything that's important is going on inside of us. It's how do I, how do I think? So psychiatry was like, oh yeah, that's really useless. <laughs> there, there was some acknowledgement of interpersonal relationships, but the idea that the location was important, this was just like, people were just looking at me aghast. It's been interesting over the past uh, 20 years how place has become something that's, that's everywhere. Everybody talks about place and how it operates. And so it's, uh, it, it's, been, it's been fun to be part of that, of really, of really a, a shift in how we think about people and where they, where they operate and where they live. So I want to start with a, a really important concept from social psychiatry that was advanced by, by one of the founders of, of this discipline, Alexander Layton, who wrote a, a three, did a three-volume series on a study of a place called Sterling County. The, um, his thesis was that when communities fell apart, people got sick. People would have higher rates of illness. And this is how he defined social disintegration. Now he had some knowledge of this because among other things that he'd done as a psychiatrist and anthropologist was work in one of the Japanese internment camps. And in fact, I saw on the video outside that there's gonna be a lecture about this experience, the Japanese internment during the Second World War where they, the United States decided after the bombing of Pearl Harbor that the Japanese Americans were a threat to national security. So they rounded them all up, took them out of their communities and homes and put them in concentration camps. And he was in one of these concentration camps, they were politely called internment camps, in Arizona. Uh, it's an extraordinary story and his book about it is just, just gripping. But so here were people who were coming from all over. The, the people who were putting the camp together weren't necessarily coming from the same place. The way they were living was completely, they, they had businesses, they had farms, they had, they had lives. They were ripped out of their lives and thrown into this camp where there was, you know, all of a sudden they had to invent a way to live together. So this, his thinking about social disintegration comes out of that and other experiences during World War II and after. What, what is it like if you rip people apart? And these are the things that you see. So um, he was saying, well, what if you see these things in a place what are we gonna learn about the health of the people that are in that place? Uh, an anthropologist who was working with him, John Hughes, did an uh, ethnography of the place where they did their study, the Sterling County, and they were looking for, well, so what is the opposite of that? What's a place that's working well? And this photograph is from one of the neighborhoods that they thought was working well. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a stunning and important photograph because it's, it, it is about education, it's about learning. Learning is, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy, not something that's happening when you're hungry, when you don't have shelter. Learning is happening when your basic needs have been taken care of and you can have peace and contentment and you can reflect on how does the world work. What, what does it mean that one plus one equals two? So here are kids in Sunday school um, and they're working, they're functioning, it's great. That, that's what we need to have. No, it's often thought that that's like a white thing. Like if you look at that, well, obviously it's white people 
right, here's where the racism that Barbara was talking about as we were opening comes in. The assumption is, well, white people could have that, but, or they're talking about white people because they're white people in the picture. But there are plenty of pictures of black people doing the same thing. And this is a photograph from a place called Hill House um, in Pittsburgh. Um, and at Hill House, so this picture was taken in 1950 by Esther Bubbly, and you know, it was just serving a very, very poor African-American community. The Hill District is a neighborhood that was uh, written about by August Wilson in his cycle of plays. So when he's talking about like the peacefulness of the Hill in the 50s, um, it, this is what he's talking about. So the, these kids are, are, I mean, if you think about the peace, the focus, the concentration, the task, these kids are learning, and that's what we want. That's the real test of a healthy society. I know many of the kids who were at Hill House in the 50s who are adults now, and they are amazing, wonderful, community-oriented people, very generous, very good spirits, because they grew up in this context, and they were nurtured by their place. This place was a segregated place, um, and it, segregation in, in Pittsburgh was documented in 1930s. Um, and this is the neighborhood. So the neighborhood was what, in what they called a, a grid of streets, very tight. And the neighborhood was classed as a slum, as a blighted slum. Um, now, it's classed as a blighted slum partly because it's dense, but also because it's poor. This is a photograph by Thank you, Charles Teeny Harris, an outstanding, amazing African-American photographer. His archive is at the Pittsburgh Carnegie Museum of Art. 80,000 photos that you can see of life in Pittsburgh. Um, and so what's important about these photos is that over and over again from different perspectives, they take you into the rich life of this community which was called a slum by outsiders why? Because they came in, they saw black people, old buildings, and other signs of poverty, and they said, oh, this is a blighted slum. We have to destroy it, because that was the policy at that time and at this time. It's, so it's this, it's this perception that this black neighborhood is blighted. Richard Saunders, who was actually my next door neighbor when I was growing up, was another of the great photographers. An extraordinary number of really great photographers went to Pittsburgh and, and did work. So this is just a street scene. Just um, if you think about Rembrandt and the Night Watch, this is men gathered in concert with each other, um, having a quiet afternoon playing checkers. So this neighborhood, which had incredible unparalleled riches, if you go to the archive, you will be astounded by what you see of the richness of this neighborhood. And the thing about Charles Teeny Harris was that he took pictures of everything. So he took pictures of the boxers and the transvestites and the crossing guards and the uh, John F. Kennedy, everything. So you, the, the complexity of the community is laid out before us. Yet this was considered a blighted slum and it was destroyed. Just wanna, uh, this is the website for the Teeny Harris archive. Um, and Stanley Crouch said, this, this collection provides us with an epic sense of life, which is to say that a civilization and how it worked is laid out before us. This is important to see, a civilization and how it worked. Now, this is Teeny Harris, Richard Saunders, Esther Bubbly, and all the other photographers who went to the Hill in the 50s, start to take us into the life of this place. In the stories that I've heard from elders there, I, it's been amazing to hear what it was like to grow up and to be part of that community. But knowing the elders there is even a truer test of what it was like to grow up in, in that community because they're great people. And so the individual is not separate from the place in which the individual is located. They, we, there's an interdependency, a profound interdependency. And what I have learned is that when we do things, social disintegration is often caused by public policies and leads to all of those outcomes that were of such concern to Dr. Layton, so that we destroy the ability of people 
to have good lives when we destroy productive places. Conversely, if we want people to have good lives, we have to create good places. So one of the first public policies that I examined closely in my own research was urban renewal, which is a, a federal policy authorized by the Housing Act of 1949, implemented between 1949 and 1973. There were 2,500 projects carried out in 1,000 cities. So 63% of the relocated people were African American, and American cities were highly segregated at that time. So I have inferred that possibly 1,600 of the projects were directed at black ghetto neighborhoods across the United States. I was um, talking about this when I was first doing this work with some Vietnam veterans, African American Vietnam veterans. And they said, oh yeah, that's what we did in Vietnam, which was explicit policies to go into many, many villages and destroy them. Um, thereby destroying the social structure of the nation. So the African American nation came under active attack all across the country. So in New York City, in Newark, in Pittsburgh, in Chicago, in St. Louis, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, all of those cities and many more carried out urban renewal directed at African American communities. The infrastructure of the African American people was bulldozed. These are the men who made, who made the plan for Pittsburgh's urban renewal. And uh, it is an amazing thing about pic Pittsburgh, they take pictures of everything. So you can, like, who made the plan? Oh, there they are. <laughs> and it's labeled the, man who, the men who made the plan. Um, so, and one of the reasons for, for leveling the African American community was to make a cultural center. And in particular, Edgar Kaufman, who was one of the big rich guys, department store magnate for whom Frank Lloyd Wright did Falling Water, um, he liked light opera, which is Gilbert and Sullivan, that kind of thing. And he liked to hear it out of doors. So this is the civic light opera crowd. And it, I mean, again, it's just amazing. They take pictures of everything at their previous home before they built the civic arena. And you can see, if you look closely, one black guy. You can see a few other black people, but it's basically they were going to destroy an African American community to make a cultural center for white people. This is the plan. So those tight streets that I showed you in the map are all going to, everything inside the plastic lines is going to be bulldozed. The circle is where they're going to put the civic arena. And those big lines are a new set of streets which are going to rapidly move traffic. But what's all, so what's going to happen in some is that they're going to create three kinds of barriers between the African American community of the hill and downtown. They're going to create highways, they're going to create a parking lot, and they're going to create a spaceship. Now, as Barbara will tell you psychologically in the 1950s, spaceships had particular meaning to American people, and you did not willingly walk past a spaceship. So the fact that this is a spaceship is not trivial in how it was perceived or how it became part of the landscape. So, uh, and in fact, um, the, uh, when they were getting ready to tear this down, an architect was fighting to save it, and he was like digging up the original sketches of the artist, of the architect who made this, and they actually were spaceships in his design. So what does it feel like when you tear down somebody's neighborhood? So the, again, this is my neighbor Richard Saunders' photo. And to me, this is the, this is the, this is the iconic photograph of Ruchak. This woman, um, and the stress and distress of losing her home the depth of pain when somebody's home is taken from them without their permission is what this photograph is about. And the movers are saying, you got to go. You got to go. And she's just saying, you don't understand. This is my home. I eventually, when I was writing my book, Root Shock, felt that I had to define it. So this is like the outside. This is what's going on on the outside. I don't know that this was her home, but this was another photo of Richard by Richard Saunders of the demolitions that were going on. The, I had to define Ruchak, and I defined it as the traumatic stress reaction to the loss of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. 
And an emotional ecosystem is many things. It's a way of life. So it doesn't necessarily, it, root shock is not confined to losing your home, um, losing the way you work, losing your culture, losing um, people who are fishermen, who have, you know, where all the, the fishing industry has overfished and people can't go fishing anymore. Those men and women have root shock because their way of life has been effectively stopped. So root shock is, it's not confined at all to what is it like to lose a home. It's really this emotional ecosystem. And what's important about this is that when we think of place, we are always thinking about something that's more complex than we can really understand. When you go out on the street here, there are people doing work, you know, sort of holes in the ground and wires and guys and trucks. What are they doing? I have no idea. And even if they told me, I would have no idea. But they're doing something which is going to make something possible for us in New York City. So the wires and holes and trucks are about electricity or trains or water. These things that we depend on, we depend on electricity. We would not be here at this moment doing this if we didn't have electricity. So this complexity of the ecosystem, what are all the pieces of it? So it's this rupture of part of that complex entity. That This complexity is not simply complex. It's a whole. It's integrated. It's woven, interwoven. You can't disturb a piece of it without disturbing the whole. And that's what really challenges our thinking in a racist apartheid society, which is that as long as you disturb black people who are different and apart and not even human beings and don't live with, with white people, we live apart, then you haven't really disturbed white people. So you haven't disturbed the whole. You can do anything you want to the black people. It doesn't matter. That's American thinking. That's, that's what's in the apartheid consciousness. And the biggest challenge of this is to understand that when you have disinvested in the Hill District, as shown in this, photo, in this um, drawing by Carlos Peterson, so that the buildings are sagging and there are holes in the street and the grief is everywhere. When you have done this, you have done it to the whole society. St. Benedict the Moor, the church at Freedom Corner, or the ravages of disinvestment in the Middle Hill. So this is the same place where men were playing chess. You don't find anybody outside these days, in, or at that time in 1999 when I took this photograph in the Hill District because it wasn't a safe place to be outside. It wasn't a comfortable place. It wasn't an attractive place. When you have done this to the Hill District, you have done this to the whole of Pittsburgh. That's the real challenge here. So we have had an exceptional number of policies that undermine neighborhoods, and particularly African-American neighborhoods. Um, and this is a short list. Um, so. I, I think that the, the challenge of gentrification has finally made it, um, thanks to Spike Lee, it, to everybody's consciousness that this is happening. It's ripping through neighborhoods. That a Brooklyn neighborhood where a working class African American family, immigrant family, could buy a brownstone for $40,000. Now the brownstones sell for $2 million. So maybe a family that bought in the 50s could sell their house and make money, but no other immigrant family will ever be able to have a brownstone in that neighborhood. And so what has happened to segregation? Segregation has not been eliminated. Segregation has been displaced. Segregation has been moved. So where are people going? Gentrification means the loss of some neighborhoods, but the relocation of the poor to other neighborhoods. Where? Where are they going? This is a fundamental question. And there's nobody who'll say, oh, I, I know where they're going. Some people say they're going to the Bronx, they're going to Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt City. In Long Island, is that what it's called? I'm blocking the name. Roosevelt, Long Island. They're certainly coming out where I am in Orange, New Jersey. They're being scattered all over, but they're trying to make new communities. But those communities are segregated communities, and they're segregated communities that are for poor people because they, they don't have much money. So where can the poor live? So the whole idea that the poor are now being displaced to the inner suburbs. Uh, but it, it's important to understand that this movement from gentrification is one in a, a long series of movements. It's important also to understand that when people say, well, people suffered from slavery, and now they're in a trouble now, 
They're skipping over a few terrible things that happened between 1865 and now, like highway construction, like deindustrialization, like mass incarceration with the war on drugs. We can't skip over these things. The, the cumulative experience of America, of people living together and making good places, is all of these things put together, one after the other. And this is what is called path, path determination. That we are on a path, but everything that happens in the path is part of the path. In fact, not only is this a precept in, in ecology, but this is a precept in Buddhism, right? Whatever is there is the path, is one of the teachings of Buddhism. And this is something that must be acknowledged in our science, that whatever happens is the path, that it, it happened. People think about resilience, and resilience has become a popular word, because it seems to defy this law. Well, whatever, we had a storm, but we're back, because we're resilient. Uh, this was especially true after Sandy, right? We're resilient, everything's going to get back. And then a year after Sandy, when we went and looked at all the consequences, tens of thousands of people weren't back. Whole cities weren't back. And no plan for how are we going to protect from the next storm. So in fact, it's not true that we are resilient. What's true is that when something happens, it's part of the path, and it changes us, and we become the next thing for better or for worse. When we, as we began to understand this, and being in the Hill, we heard many, many stories that helped us piece together that these many policies that had hit the neighborhoods, hit the Hill District, for example, but Harlem, South Bronx, all of these neighborhoods have a similar kind of story, if not identical. We said, so what happens to communities that are repeatedly hit? And what we found was that, indeed, they, there was an effort to reorganize after any kind of problem, which is what we call resilience. But because the insults or assaults, public policies that undermine these neighborhoods, came so fast, one upon the, the heels of the other, the neighborhoods never completely recovered. And so they fell into deeper and deeper states of just, of just different order. There's always order, but it's always different. Some people say, no, it's not disordered. It's like, yeah, well, you know, it goes from what, we, what the Hill District had in the 50s, which was a system in which every adult was in charge of every child. There was a child system and there was an adult system, and they were tightly interconnected. That no longer exists in the Hill or in any African-American community, just ask people to say, well, when I was growing up, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't happen anymore. What has happened is fragmentation and fear and suspicion. And it's in that context that the terrible consequences that Dr. Layton talked about, the breaking apart of the family, the rise in hostility, the rise in crime, that all of those consequences occur when the social fabric is broken into little pieces that can't function together. And the people are no longer sane. The rates of illness go way up. So Barbara and I um, you know, started, we're both working on this problem, which is that in the context of this destruction of communities, there was not only an increase in the rates of illness, but introduction of new illnesses that we had never seen before. And this teaches us something fundamental about ecology, which is that when you change the ecosystem, you change what's going to emerge as the disease. So the more we keep changing, the more we will see diseases that we don't understand. And what's also important is that these diseases pile up in the bodies of the people who are in these terribly destructive places. So that it is possible to meet people that ha who have AIDS and crack addiction and have been victims of violence and have trauma-related mental illness, <coughs> multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, asthma, and obesity. It's not hard to imagine somebody with all those problems. The question is, well, what do you do for somebody who has all those problems? That's really tough. Nobody has the answer. Even one of these is tough. Well, we have created plagues that are not only exist, but they interact with each other. So the crack epidemic fueled the AIDS epidemic, fueled the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis epidemic. The violence epidemic, which raised the levels of stress, fueled the asthma epidemic and the obesity epidemic. 
So these plagues are not happening independently because in an ecosystem, nothing happens independently. They are changing and shaping and what's most scary is that they are accelerating each other. So the question that um, I pose to people who work on cities in the United States and France was well, what do we do? We're in a system of what I've called mad plagues. How do we pivot? And the pivot is from a system in, of neighborhoods that have, and cities that have fallen apart from each other. So they are dominated by groups that are just locked into self-centered fear. Think of gated communities or people walking around with guns because they have to be able to protect themselves. To what we had before, which are communities where there was really other focused confidence. Adults were looking out for children. Adults were looking out for each other. Somebody could, who needed a cup of sugar could go next door and borrow a cup of sugar or borrow $20. There's, you know, people would say, oh, do you need any help? Can I help you? That this disappears in the context of the destruction of neighborhoods and it's what we have to pivot back to. So um, how do we pivot? So I think that the part of this is conceptual. And William Morish and Catherine Brown, who Herbert Buschamp, the architecture critic for the New York Times, said were the outstanding American urbanists of this generation, said that, that what we had to do was plan to stay. So planning a neighborhood, they said, is a participatory act of community membership and an expression of belief about the future of one's community. Before residents and merchants can begin planning for their neighborhood, participants must make a sin sincere declaration about themselves. We are planning to stay. Now, if you remember the lady in that photograph, the woman with Ruchak, she was planning to stay too, right? She was planning to stay. She was just not going to be allowed to stay. So I'm not saying this like out of, out of like in some naive way about what all these public policies are. I've been face to face with these public policies in the history books for 20 years. These are brutal policies and they are not about allowing people to plan to stay. What I am saying is that if we plan to stay on this planet as a species of human beings, we need to plan to stay. <laughs> we have to get out, we cannot, we cannot survive these policies of incessant serial forced displacement of any population, but certainly repeated displacement of African Americans. Um, we, you know, we're joking around that you know whatever's wrong with the American city, the answer is move the black people. No, that's a wrong answer. Whatever's wrong with the American city, let's make a sincere declaration to each other that we're planning to stay. It's on that basis that we can begin to take new actions. In my conversations with people who I think are doing exemplary work in re-knitting the American city as a place um, for everybody. Um, I have identified what I call the elements of urban restoration nine. And uh, this is what I wrote about in my new book, Urban Alchemy. So I want to tell you about a few of them. The first element is keep the whole city in mind. And this is like, in planning to say is it's the first challenge, because we're in a system of serial displacement, um, then keep the whole city in mind is the second. When I first started to work in Pittsburgh in 1997, I was really focused on the Hill District. I thought the answer to the Hill was in the Hill. I started to work with urbanist Michel Cantal Dupart, and he was like, you know, the problem in the Hill is that the Hill was systematically cut off from the rest of the city. They cut the buses, they cut the roads, they put in the civic arena. So it was cut off from the flow of the city. It was cut off from jobs, it was cut off from investment, it was cut off from everything. The solution to the problems of the hill is that you have to reconnect it to the city. So you have to have the city in mind. That, that urban neighborhoods that have been marginalized, really the marginalization is the problem. And the marginalization is not in the neighborhood, it's actually the border, the connection of the neighborhood to the city. So that's where we have to work. How do we reconnect? It's all about reconnection. Shortly after we started that work, um, Pittsburgh's River Life Task Force came out with a map and, and people in the hill had said, you know what, you gotta include the hill. And all of a sudden the hill, which had been invisible, was not only on the map, but it was connecting to the river. Now the hill is, doesn't touch the river, right? See that the hill doesn't touch the river. But they were saying the hill has to connect to the river. So these are, um, you know, this is a fundamentally important shift. We 
always talk about communities. We always talk about my community, my neighborhood. We are a fragmented nation. And part of the, the, the pride and the joy of my neighborhood, my community, is also part of the apartheid system. So we have to be able to say my neighborhood in my city and my region and my nation. Those are more complex thought. Again, ecology is complex, and so we have to really begin to think ecologically. Um, do you think this is going to come? Maybe not. Um, look online and see the, a redlining map. Just Google redlining maps. Um, Benjamin Franklin, at the signing of the Declaration, said the most profound thing, which is, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. This is, this is what's in our face. And perhaps we've all been cold enough this winter to believe it. <laughs> the second element is that you have to find what you're for. I learned this from my father, who is a great community organizer and union organizer. In 1958, he wrote this platform called the New Day Platform for our town of Orange, New Jersey. And what's important about this, and I, I reproduced this table in Urban Alchemy, is that this is, a, this is a platform that addresses the complexity of the city. Redevelopment and relocation, unemployment, the freeway which was gonna come through and chop the town in half, the school system, civil rights, recreation and juvenile delinquency, and representative government. He talks about the problem of water, which in 2007, um, actually held up new, con new construction and because they still hadn't fixed the water system or whatever. They hadn't kept the water system up to date. And it held up the construction just long enough for the whole economy to collapse. So all the buildings that were going to get built or going to get redeveloped didn't get redeveloped because of the water. He was talking about the water in 1958. So it, people who have this kind of ecological thinking, they look like, oh my God, how did you know that in 1958? But it was because he had an ecological view. And if you have an ecological view, people will look at you like you are Ernest Thompson. So who are you? The, th the third one is that make a mark. So when we look at depleted communities and we look at the hill and all those buildings are missing, we think, oh my god, i got to build a building or something. And um, Ken Joyno, who's an urbanist in Pittsburgh, was like, you know, actually where you get started is you make a mark. Make a mark is much simpler than a building. A building takes years and takes hundreds of thousands of dollars. A mark is something we make all the time. One of the most famous marks that I've encountered is this billboard, which was erected to fight against a highway that was planned to come through the hill. So after they did all that urban renewal, then they wanted to do a highway. Um, and they said, no, no more redevelopment. We're not going to do it. You're not going to take another 10 blocks of the neighborhood. And they actually stopped it. This is a mark, it's the, a billboard, right? A billboard is not cheap, but people pooled their pennies and they put up this billboard. They made a statement in the urban space about how they thought it should go forward. They said two things, no redevelopment beyond this point, and we demand low income housing for the lower hill. This is one of the most famous marks that was ever made. And since this is especially the 40th, is it the 40th? can't be the 40th. 30 years since the 30th. Oh, 30th anniversary. Uh, it's a good one to show. At the beginning of the epidemic, people thought crack, which always happens with epidemics of drugs, right? It, when the drug first appears, everybody's like, oh, you, have you tried this cool new drug? Try it. It's, you'll love it. So everybody was trying crack, and it turned out you could get addicted really quickly, and it was a, a mess. But everybody, it, you were still in this like, wow, crack is so fun. It blows your mind. And you can just get some at the crack house on the corner. Uh, and, and Keith Herring did this mural and he said, crack is whack. It'll take all your money and leave you dead. And you can still see this mural as you drive down the Harlem River Drive. This was a fundamentally important statement in the public space about the nature of crack. Keith Herring defined the nature of crack. And that becomes the pivot. When I talk about how do we go from mad plagues to sane urbanism, this is, we have to pivot. How do we pivot? Part of the pivot is that we have to have the city in mind. We have to find what we're for. And we have to make a mark in the urban space that says where we're coming from and where we're going. Th this is a pivot. This is a second point of pivot, the um, bringing of the AIDS quilt to the Washington Mall because AIDS was a stigmatized illness, redlined, and 
And AIDS activists had to break into the consciousness of the nation that people were dying from this dreadful disease. And they had to get the scope of the disease onto the table in some way. And so they brought these, eight, these quilt pieces from the AIDS quilt and laid them out. Each four by six piece is a person. In the sense that back in the days of the plague, when half a city would die and the carts would go through the streets and they would say, bring out your dead, and people would bring out the dead and put them on the carts. Here we had to bring out our dead, but for a different purpose. We had to bring out our dead so that we could stop the epidemic. So I'm going to skip ahead. Um, out of those elements, those first three elements, comes uh, what Ken Doino and I agreed was, was alignment that we get our, our purpose. If we know, if we have the city in mind, so we're thinking ecologically, if we know what we're for, and if we've made a mark, we've gotten on the same page. And that is fundamentally important. People often think, I can't, the city is like too big. You can't fight City Hall. What am I going to do? The point is that, of course, you're not going to do it alone. You got to get some people. What do you do with those people? This is what you do with those people. You think about the city, you find out what you're for, and then you make a mark. At that point, you can really begin to create the city that we need. We, we are the people who make the city. Um, and if we're planning to stay, what we have to do is make the city. So the last element that is, is celebrate. And I just wanted to talk about a project that we have called CLIMB, City Life is Moving Bodies, which has been, um, and this is Lourdes Rodriguez, who's been the leader of that project for 10 years now. We, we got the idea that these escarpment parks, which go through Harlem and Washington Heights, were in terrible shape, and especially High Bridge was really scary. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to make a hiking trail, which is one of the things that's recommended in public health so people will get more exercises. If there's a trail, people will walk on it. So we thought, why don't we make a trail through the escarpment parks? And that will help to get investment and reclaim them. It will be great. So our, our proposed trail actually goes from Central Park to the Cloisters, so a little, it goes a little further than shown on this map, but the green are the parks that we go through on our hike. We hike, uh, we do many things as CLIMB, which is a consensus group of organizations in northern Manhattan. Uh, but our big event is that we do an annual party on the first Saturday of June, which is National Trails Day. And this is my daughter Molly, who's leading kids from Harlem Children's Zone, who had hiked all the way up from, um, I think they started at Jackie Robinson Park. And they had to go through Highbridge Forest. They'd never been in a forest before. So they had a great time. We told them there might be snakes in the forest. So every other second, a kid thought they saw a snake. And then as soon as they got through, after screaming the whole way, they said, can we go again? <laughs> this year is, is our 10th anniversary. And we're actually inaugurating our trail, uh, Draft Path. We're going to do that on the um, first Saturday in May, which is when um, People have Jane Walks in cities throughout the nation, so we're going to do a Jane Walk. And then we're doing Hike the Heights 10 on June 7th. Come and party with us. Bring your friends. Bring all of Teachers College. Uh, it will be great. So um, we can make great cities together in which we will have health, in which we can minimize disease, in which children can learn. This is our goal, to, to create healthy human beings who will have a lifetime of being good citizens. Um, we are far from that. We are in a national policy of destroying communities. But we have to shift from whatever the problem is with the city, move the black people, to planning to stay. So thank you for your kind attention. Okay, so we are delighted that we um, actually have time for, for questions. Uh, a good 10 minutes, it appears to be. And I, I'd just like to say that um, I really, really enjoyed your presentation, Mindy. Uh, it, it reminded me of something that I observed in Philadelphia. And now I have a, a deeper appreciation of the role of urban renewal. But when you ask yourself, what are the outcomes of the urban renewal that you outlined so, so well from a historical perspective? And in Philadelphia, my observation has been it seems as though the only place, places where people have lived that actually get imploded, bombed, and have you seen a, the implosion of a building? There are so many of those projects that have been imploded. 
Okay, so you have to ask yourself, where has any racial ethnic group lived where the outcome of where they lived is that we bomb it, we implode it, and then once we've gotten rid of it, it's exactly what you're saying. Where have the people gone? Where have they gone? Because now that we have in Philadelphia, you know, um, houses, they're little teeny cheap houses, but they're houses where people have mortgages and they can drive up and park their car and pretend like they're living the life that their parents lived in North Carolina and South Carolina, but these are employed people. But you're still saying, where did the poor people go? And it's, it's very painful to, to think about the fact that nobody cares, nobody thinks about it. Um, I also came to graduate school and lived in Harlem starting in 1980. And so I have been able to observe the transformation in Harlem here in New York over the past, uh, whatever that is, 34 years. And one of my jokes is, well, at least now we have sidewalks without cracks. <laughs> you know, because during the period uh, before gentrification, you know, it's like there was the disinvestment that you talked about. Um, and so, you know, just to, I remember in the, in the 1980s when it was historical for my roommate to bring her white friends from Wall Street who'd never been to Harlem. And, and then to see the transformation where, okay, look to the left, okay, a white family now owns that brownstone, <laughs> look to the right, uh, a white family now owns or that brownstone. And just to realize that with the war on drugs and mass incarceration crisis, all those people came back and there was just no neighborhood for them at all. But there were sidewalks without cracks. So I just wanna congratulate you on your work. I want everyone to appreciate just how phenomenal it is that in your publications and in your talk, we get to have a, an understanding of the dynamics that are operating. So I had more of a comment. Maybe you wanna comment on what I've shared. It was so perfect, Barbara. <laughs> Does somebody have a, a, another comment that they would like to share? Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, you know, as you, you describe the, um, the implosion of neighborhoods, I was thinking, because I live in Brooklyn, I've lived there, lived there for 10 years in the Bed-Stuy area, and one thing I noticed that you didn't talk a lot about, and I'm hoping that you can speak to, is the tension between people. What happens when your neighbor is moved out that you've been living next to for 20 years, and then you have another family that's moved in, and the emotional devastation that you feel because your neighbor for 20 years can't no longer afford to live where they've, they've been living for all their lives, and now you have a new neighbor, and there's no communication, there's no neighborliness, and there's that tension that's building that can fuel violence, that fuels fear, and that fuels a sense of confusion, uh, and also disintegrate communities. So no one is kind of attending to that, now I hate you because you've moved in and have kind of done nothing to me, but because my neighbor is now in somewhere else or can't afford to be here, I have this sense of, of, of hate and this feeling of fear and this feeling of you did this to us. Um, so can you speak a little bit to the sense of or the lack of um, communication and interaction as neighborhoods begin to gentrify and the, sen the sense of this kind of boiling pressure and tension that, that's happening in neighborhoods um, that's a little bit unspoken? Uh, you said it so well, What's, what needs to be added? Well, what I'd like to add is that um, <clears throat> this system is an all or nothing system. So the, either there are black people or there aren't black people. So the real problem is that when the wealthy white people show up, or the wealthy black people, because who's white and who's black changes all the time. So wealthy black people might be edging into white, whatever. When the white people, sh when the so-called white people show up, Everybody knows what that means, which is the black people got to get out. Because that's how our system works. So the thing, of the, the, it, it's, it's a just, if they have come, we're going. And everybody knows this. So the challenge is, how do we, how do we exit from that system? There, there's a lot of room in Harlem. 50% of the population left between 1960 and 1990 and a third of the buildings burned down. So there's a lot of room, we can move in a lot of white people, it'll be fine, we could all be neighbors. 
But the system doesn't work like that. The system doesn't allow the poor or the black to stay. So how do we challenge that? That's what, that's what we have to pivot. That's what the pivot is about. It's exactly what you said. The people are angry because they know it's, they're coming for them. So how do we pivot out of that? And that's a problem for all of us. Um, I guess that I just sort of have, I live in Harlem right now. I'm not from here. And I have this internal struggle constantly with who is we? So I look like the people that have been pushed out of this community, but I'm not necessarily a part of that we. So how do we, people that look like people from these communities, fit into that we? And are we part of that planning to stay? Do you think, what is, what is our role in that gentrification? I think that's a pressing question. I, I think that the uh, ecologists really try to point out that there's no, there's no them or there. There's only us and here. So just forget the we. Like we, we are we, everybody, all of us, the whole planet, right? If there's an earthquake in Haiti, it happened to me. I was like, oh, I wasn't affected by it. Mm, wrong, right? We're, we're affected by everything that happens. It's a, it's a single ecosystem on one path. That man is moving his thing. He's about to tell me to end. So think of yourself as part of the we and get together with your neighbors and find out what you're for. What I did not hear, and I would like, if you can, to speak about in that planning to stay, um, how do we plan if there's not a voice at the table? And when I say voice at the table, we think that there's a voice at the table with elected officials, people who've been in there in offices, and uh, not necessarily representing the people in the neighborhood. Can you speak to the political dynamics of planning to stay? She said that was a quick question, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to make me go away. I can't. I will just say one thing. Go look at the pictures of the Berlin Wall in 1960, and go look at the pictures of the Berlin Wall in 1992. There's no Berlin Wall in 1992. It's gone. How did it go? Uneven. It just went. One day, people just knocked it down. That's what happens with people. One day we just say, oh, you know what? I'm sick of slavery. Let's don't have it anymore. We don't have it anymore. We don't have slavery anymore. One day we're going to say, we don't want apartheid anymore, and we're not going to have it anymore. And how do we get to that day? We have to find what we're for, because what we're for is actually a chance for our children to learn and grow and have a life. All of us are for that. How are we going to get there? There's no way forward in this current system. We have to plan to stay. I don't no, think they're going to let me talk oh, anymore. Well, you know, oh. yeah, I think we're going to have to just allow you to encounter things. Yes. Okay. <laughs> let me get my water bottle. Is it back there? Can you mind this one? Or can I just hand it out? These are the important questions. So this is yet another historic talk that we've had here at Teachers College. So let's give her a hand. So we're going to present Dr. Minnie Thompson Fully Love with this award. And then we're also going to uh, pose with photographs with um, the journal where uh, Mindy has a chapter. We're even going to ask uh, Robert to come up since he has a I mean an article. And actually, they're also on the editorial board. So we'll take a photograph with this as well, with my iPad there. But right now, this is Mindy's moment. And so the Center for Health Equity and Urban Science Education, CHUS, and the Research Group on Disparities in Health of Teachers College University honor Mindy Thompson Fully Love, MD. Professor of Clinical Sociomedical Sciences, Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, 
and professor of clinical psychiatry, Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Four, outstanding national and international service in advancing the scholarship, research, practice, and policy that fosters the healing of urban environments and progress toward equity and health for all. March 18, 2014, Sixth Annual Health Disparities Research Conference. Congratulations. <laughs> so let's take a picture. No, 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 no. Give, 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 it, give it to uh, Nana. But did you see how this woman stood up for the same innovation? <laughs> Come on, stand up. <laughs> it's good for your health. <laughs> Five minutes for photographs. So. <laughs> right. Okay, so now we'll make a mark. Come on, Bob. A photograph. Now it's it's twenty dollars, and we're selling it. But it's the prettiest journal you'll ever purchase. In addition to I mean, everything you ever wanted to know about the impact of the crack epidemic and the ongoing public health crisis. All right, so I'll here, you, you hold your award. Okay. I'll hold a journal, and here you can hold a journal, Bob. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> no, that's good, because you have the, uh, you have the time. all right, all right, here we go, history. <laughs> We're still here. All right. Take another one. <laughs> <laughs> this is more important than questions, isn't it? <laughs> okay, you burned your roll. Come on, Nixon. Thank you. All right. Congratulations. Okay, let me just, uh, I said this one, so sorry. all right, so is uh, Dr. Emden in the house yet? All right, so then we can have uh, a couple more questions for Mindy. Come on, Carla. Oh, did Carla leave? Come on. Try to be quick. Um, Thank you so much yes. for your presentation, and I particularly look forward to reading more about um, what you've written. But I really find the term root shock to really explain much of what um, we are experiencing on the ground in Harlem. Um, and I particularly um, focus on parents and what it is like to parent amidst all of this going on. I think in connection to the question that was asked about, you know, how do you plan to stay? Planning is also a cognitive process. And so one of the things that I was wondering is as all of these things occur and the body, the mind, the spirit experiences these um, shocks over and over again, what's also happening is they are eroding on an individual level, a mother, a father, a child's ability to plan to stay, to organize on the political level. So I wanted to know, in terms of all, almost creating new human experiences, whether we're looking at it from a psychiatric or a psychological process, it seems that we need to make inroads as to how to help people absorb and then become resilient with these shockers. And I'm wondering, from a mental health perspective, if you see this happening therapeutically, where people are learning how to galvanize in order to absorb and to plan to stay. I don't know if my question is clear. I, I, I'm a psychiatrist. I don't think that this is a time when people need therapy. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a really, as a social psychiatrist, we think about levels of scale. So what does the individual need? There, there's times when individuals need therapy. But, and there are times when people need help 
They need to manage a problem, but they need to be able to do it in concert with other people. So to think about this as well, that we need to have crisis counselors coming into Harlem is absolutely wrong. That this is a, a collective trauma, and as my colleague Jack Saul has written in his book, Collective Trauma, Collective Recovery, what we need is collective recovery. Um, I had, a, had an interesting experience when I first started studying the psychology of place. I, I read a book about a group of Israeli um, army men who were captured during a war in Egypt and put into a single room, and they were kept there for a couple of years. And during that time, they, they were tortured, and all kinds of bad things happened. Then they were put into this room. There was tremendous uncertainty about what would happen to them. Would, would they ever get out? Um, but they managed this by creating a small society in this room, and they actually accomplished remarkable things. And by the time they got home, none of them had post-traumatic stress disorder. I, well, that was interesting enough, but then I picked up a book called The Golden Thirteen, which is about the first African Americans in World War II who were selected to become officers in the Navy, to, to try to become officers. They, obviously, the Navy was segregated. These were going to become the first black officers. And there were 16 men, and the first shock was they were put in a room, a single room. I was like, wait, this sounds like those Israeli guys. Their experience was almost word for word the same. So the Israeli guys in 1967, these black guys during World War II, no connection. Not like they knew each other's stories, but they found the same solutions which was to work together in a group to take stock of their resources and then to figure out creative solutions. Um, I have called this empowered collaboration. And I think what's important is that how protective it is of, of psychological health. And therefore, the answer is that we cannot do this alone. We cannot do it with the help of therapy. We are not indeed resilient. We, as individuals, everything that shocks us becomes a permanent part. We embody the pains and the agonies that we live through. They become part of our bodies, right? This is what weathering is. This is why the adverse childhood experiences show up later on in life. In your 60s and 70s, do you have heart disease? Yeah, because you had an adverse experience in childhood. We don't shed these things. They form us. So how are we going to weather this storm? We're going to weather it together. So empowered collaboration is what we have to re reach for. We have to reach for our neighbors. The thing is that this often, in these situations, feels hard, like I don't know anybody, or I don't like them, or they're rich white people, why would they want to have a meeting with me? Or I'm a rich white person, why would I want to have a meeting with them? So you know, people don't know where to start. And the, that's where it's important to know that you can start small. Just, just start small. And I'll tell you the most important thing, parties. Because everybody's depressed and scared. And it's easiest to get people to come to a party. Parties are really important. And in my book, one of the discoveries I made in the process of writing Urban Alchemy was that June is community building party season. Not simply because we have our party then, hike the heights, but because everybody has a party. There are going to be so many parties. Everywhere you go, there's going to be a party. So give a party, go to a party, meet some people, then start from there. So the June community building party season is explicitly created to help us weather the storm. And it's coming up soon to your neighborhood, I promise you. Or if you not in your neighborhood, come to my party, all of northern Manhattan. Do we still have more time? Are we looking for Dr. Emden? That was we'll, He's, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end there. Great. Thank you so much.